This morning's scripture will be coming from Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in fault, ye which are spiritual, restore him. One in, one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burden, and so fulfill the law of Christ. But if a man think himself to be somewhat, if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoice in himself alone, and not in others. For every man shall bear his own burden. I read you Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. May God add a blessing to the readers, hearers, and doers of his word. I would ask that you go into prayer with us. Oh, Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, Father, just thanking you, Father. Father, we just want to thank you for all that you've done for us, Father. Father, how you've watched over us, guided us, protected us, Father. How you woke up this morning, Father, to start us on our way, Father. How you kept us, Father, through the night as we slept and slumbered, Father. Father, we just want to thank you, Father, for all the blessings that we've received, Father. How you set your son for us, Father. Lord, through him we can have eternal life, Father. We want to thank you for your Holy Spirit, Father, that dwells with us, Father. Help keeping us on that right path, Father. Showing us where the bad spots are, Father. Just keeping us, Father, keeping our minds straight, Father. Father, we ask, Father, that you forgive us, Father, for sins, trespasses, Father, evil thoughts and deeds that we've done, Father. Father, we ask you to have mercy on us, Father. Father, because we know it is nothing we can do, Father, or have did, Father that earns your mercy, Father, but you give it freely, Father, to anyone, Father, that you so choose, Father. Father, we ask you to help us love our brother, Father. Help us not to be backbiters and backstabbers, Father. Father, we just want to ask you to help us love each other, Father, as Christ loved the church, Father. Father, we ask you, Father, that you go with us, Father, as we go forth, Father. Father, we ask that you help Pyramid Valley, Father. Help us to be the church, Father, that sits on the hill, Father. Father, we ask you to bless all the members, Father. Father, bless our pastor, Father, who's traveling down life's highways and byways, Father. Father, we ask that you keep him safe, Father. We ask that you heal him, Father, over any stumbles, the trips, the falls that's going to come about him, Father. We ask you to bless his family, Father. Bless his wife, his sons, his daughters, Father. Father, we ask that you keep him, Father, where he can be able to feed your sheep, Father. We ask that you guide and protect him, Father. Father, we ask you watch over all the ministers, Father, here today, Father, the one that's going to bring the word, Father. We ask you to let him, Father, be able to bring your word forth with boldness, Father, and excitement, Father. Father, we ask you to give him one. We ask you to let him do one thing, Father. Preach the word, preach the word, preach the word, Father. Father, we just want to say that we love you, Father. And Father, we ask that you lead, guide, heal, and touch us all, Father. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Lord, we just love you today. And you know it's time to lift up his holy name through songs, hymns, and spiritual songs this morning. So please join with us as we just lift our Savior up. He's so worthy to up our praise. Yeah. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. Yeah. Our God is a healer. Right. We could just go on and on and on talking about our God this morning. Darkness, into the darkness you shine. 
of the ashes will rise. Out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. None like you. None like you. Our God is greater. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. Lord, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome in power, our God, our God, our God is greater, our God is stronger, Lord, you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God,
There's no God like Jehovah. 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 song is deserved. I don't know how many of y'all ever heard of that song. But the, the lyric in the song is, thank God, I thank God I didn't get what I deserved. <laughs> and if you ever get a chance to hear the song, you'll be blessed because it makes the powerful, powerful point that as much as we fuss about what we deserve. If we really had things in the right perspective, we would understand that we should thank God we have not received what we deserved. Because our transgressions deserved judgment, deserved condemnation, separation from God. But God didn't give us what we deserved. God gave us grace. And by grace, he gave his life for ours. That we could have eternal life through our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
What a blessing. What a blessing. Well, good morning, Pilgrim Valley. Good to be with you all this morning. We're going to take a little trip back in time to 2 Chronicles chapter 13. If you have scriptures with you, please turn there. This is, uh, we're entering the month of August. This is our first Sunday in August, and August is return to school time, and other transitions take place during this time of year. And it's an important time to get some first principles uh, uh, reiterated and be reminded. And our study this morning from First Chronicles 13 is going to do this, just that. First Chronicles 13, excuse me, Second Chronicles 13, verse 5 is the key text. We'll read several other verses in the course of our time, but verse 5 is our single text verse. Ought ye not to know that the Lord God of Israel gave the kingdom over Israel to David? forever, even to him and his sons by a covenant of Saul. Please be seated. Ought ye not to know? The subject I'm using this morning is a few things we ought to know. Four in particular. A few things we ought to know. And we're going to derive those things from a passage of scripture that describes a very interesting historical event in the life of the nation of Israel. As humans, when young, our knowledge and reasoning limits cause us to be quite curious about the things we don't know. Y'all remember what it was like and may not remember what it was like, but you know what it's like when you watch little ones around you. Children start asking questions about their world as soon as they can put the words together. What is this? What's that? What does it do? Why? <laughs> and almost every, every, you know you're in trouble once they got to the why. <laughs> and it was about that time, you said, well, you're just going to <laughs> you're just gonna have to trust me. That's our nature early. But a curious thing seems to happen to us over time. Over time, we get to the place where instead of being curious and wanting to learn and apply that knowledge, we get to a place where we just kind of think we know enough. We get to that place where there ain't really anything you can tell me. I'm, I'm not asking you any more questions because if I need to know, I'll find out for myself. But I, we get to that point of that loss of understanding that there is more that we don't know and there are things that we need to know that we need to apply into our lives and of course this is not helped by the design that we apply to our educational system that lets us graduate with degrees and uh, establish these arbitrary measures of knowledge that if you got a master's or you got a PhD or that somehow you you've got some big level of understanding. But in reality, every human mind is capable of much, much more understanding than what's measured by our degrees in our educational systems. We need to understand that God wants much more than that in our hearts and in our minds. God wants us to understand some truths that are much more substantial than facts and arguments and proverbs and quick little sayings. God wants us to understand some deep truths about him and our relationship to him. And there's a passage of scripture in 2 Chronicles 13 that we're going to read through this morning that really helps us understand just a few, just a few of these important facts, principles, concepts 
knowledge that God wants in the human heart, no matter what our age, no matter what our educational level, no matter what our background, God wants us to understand these things. These are things that we ought to know. One of the blessings of the Old Testament scriptures is that they give us examples that illustrate important spiritual truths for application. And as Paul put it in 1 Corinthians 10, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and hope, that we through patience and understanding might have hope. Well, the 13th chapter of Second Chronicles contains a good example. It tells us a snippet of the history of Israel that occurred after the life of King David and his son Solomon. We are all familiar with David and David getting the kingdom and God appointing him as king to have a man after his own heart. And after David came Solomon, one of the wisest men who's ever lived, uh, ruled with justice, uh, unparalleled, but Solomon was flawed, had, had deep immorality problems. And a problem with that was his son, who was going to be the next king, didn't have Solomon's wisdom. And even before Solomon passed, Solomon didn't have Solomon's wisdom. Because there was one of his chief uh, administrators in his kingdom named Jeroboam. And Jeroboam took care of a lot of Solomon's business. And Jeroboam got dissatisfied with how things were going. And God was dissatisfied with Solomon and how he was leading. And God sent a prophet to Jeroboam and said, Jeroboam, I'm going to give you some of this kingdom. There were 12 tribes of Israel. You can think of them as states in our modern context. God told Jeroboam, Jeroboam, you're going to get 10 of them. And that's what happened. Solomon heard about it. He tried to kill Jeroboam. Jeroboam left. When he came back after Solomon... Jeroboam got and organized those ten tribes together and they split from the other two. So you had ten tribes in the north, two tribes in the south, Judah and Benjamin, that remained under the rule of the sons of David. And Solomon's son, Rehoboam, was not a wise man and things didn't go well. But then his son came on the scene by the name of Abijah. And it's in that context that we're reading this morning. Abijah's come on the scene. Jeroboam has taken ten tribes. And you know what Jeroboam did when he took ten tribes? He took ten tribes and he says, you know, it doesn't make sense that the folks need to go to Jerusalem to worship. I'm trying to set things up up here in the north. So they don't need to go down there to worship. So he set up golden calves in the north for the people to worship and established idolatry as the foundational moral principle of his new kingdom. And it was tragic. It was a tremendous tragedy. Abijah comes along, and Abijah has in his heart and in his mind, you know, this is... <laughs> This isn't right. Somebody needs to talk to that boy. <laughs> and he's, they, weren't, they weren't related, but they were now the kings of divided kingdoms. Two s southern tribes following the line of David who have the word of God, and are, or at least on paper are trying to follow it. Ten northern tribes who have left and who are, eh, they follow a little bit, but ultimately they're worshiping idols. And here comes a confrontation between Abijah and Jeroboam. And in this confrontation, you and I can learn some things that are characterized by what Abijah tells Jeroboam. So let's start at verse 1. Now in the 18th year, of the king of Jeroboam began Abijah to reign over Judah. So Jeroboam's king in Israel, Abijah's king in Judah. Jeroboam's been king for a good while. 
And Abijah reigned three years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Micaiah, the daughter of Uriel of Gabeah, and there was war between Abijah and Jeroboam. I mean, for, as Jerry Clower, the old country comedian, would say, they were forevermore at war. I mean, this we're not talking throwing a few rocks and bricks and having a little cut. No, they had tens of thousands of soldiers armed and ready for battle. Verse 3 says, And Abijah set the battle in array with an army of valiant men of war, even 400,000 chosen men. Jeroboam also set the battle in array against him with 800,000, twice as many. We're going to get it on. Mighty men of valor. And then verse 4, And Abijah stood up upon Mount Zemaraim, which is in Mount Ephraim. He's going up to Israel. Ephraim is part of the, the northern tribes. And he says, Hear me, thou Jeroboam, and all Israel. Ought ye not to know that the Lord God of Israel gave the kingdom over Israel to David forever, even to him and to his sons by a covenant of salt. And the covenant of salt was a a way of making something known and accepted and understood. It's like putting the seal on it that would make it a law. There's four things that I want us to get as we go through these next several verses in the brief time that we have this morning. The first, and it will come through in verses 5 and 6, is this. We need to know this. We need to accept that God reigns. We need to know that that's, that's, a, that's something we just need to come down to as a fact. It's not some well, you know, I kind of want God to be in charge. You know, it won't matter whether you want it or not. God reigns. <laughs> that's who he is. We should accept that. We don't have to come to an understanding we just need to recognize it as true and then we'll learn in a few more verses we need to learn God's rules God reigns but we also need to learn his rules because they are unaffected by our preferences God's rules don't change because we prefer something else and three we need to embrace God's relationship with us. It makes a difference. It's the key to our peace and our prosperity. And fourth, we need to trust God's arm of deliverance. If we can learn those four things, that's not all to know, absolutely not. But as you move along in life, Go to college, get a new job, marry somebody. Through your transitions in life and through the static place that you may be at the moment, having an understanding that these are pillars upon which you understand reality, some of them can, can really be a blessing. And we can see it in the context of this very interesting little battle I say little battle. We're talking, we're talking major war. We're talking one of the largest battles in history, certainly in biblical history. So let's look at the first one, verse, verses 5 and 6. Abijah says, Ought ye not to know that the Lord God of Israel gave the kingdom over Israel to David forever, even to him and to his sons by a covenant? Yet Jeroboam, and he's speaking to Jeroboam, yet Jeroboam, he's talking to you, I'm talking to you, the servant of Solomon, the son of David, is risen up and hath rebelled against his Lord. He has made up his mind that he is now the one who is in charge. But the fact that he's made up his mind that he's the one in charge doesn't put him there. God gave him those tribes. But God didn't give him the authority to change who God is. 
which is what Jeroboam was setting about to do. God gave Jeroboam the ability to be in command, but Jeroboam decided, well, we don't need to worship that God in Jerusalem. We don't need to worship at that temple down there. We're going to build temples in Bethel and Dan unto our own gods. And God gives us a lot of prerogative in meaning opportunity to choose for ourselves. But God doesn't give us the option to choose a false God. Now I say he doesn't give us the option. Yes, you can do it. There are people who do it all the time. We choose all manner of idols to follow and worship. But what I mean by it is it won't be without consequence. Yes, you can make that boy or that girl or you can make that job or that car or that house or you can make your popularity. You can make all of those things the thing that you just got to have and order your life to possess it and keep it and honor it in such a way that it's all you want. You can do that. But know the consequences as you do. And what this passage illustrates is that Jeroboam making the choice to create his own God apart from the scriptures was going to have dire consequences for him and all those that followed him. Verses, the next few verses after that we learn that we should know what God expects. What does God want from you? There are a number of passages all throughout Scripture that tell us what God wants. You can read the commandments, the Ten Commandments. If there's anybody in here that's never committed the Ten Commandments to mind, do it. You should learn what God's values are. Know what it is God expects of you, that God doesn't want you to be a liar. God doesn't want you to disrespect your parents. God doesn't want you to steal. God doesn't want you to covet. God doesn't want you to commit adultery. God wants you to love him. Not because he is somehow egotistically inclined that he has to have your affection in order to be okay. He doesn't need us. But he wants us to love him because in loving him, we are blessed. We find our greatest experience of life from a relationship with the one who made us. We find our greatest opportunity for peace and joy in that way. So we should learn his rules. The Lord says, what does the Lord require of you, O man, but to love God and keep his commandments? What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? What did Jesus say? He said, love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. Learn God's rules. What does God want? And say, what God wants is what I want to do. What I want to pursue. And in Jeroboam's confrontation with, excuse me, Abijah's confrontation with Jeroboam, he tells him what Jeroboam has done. He says, and there are gathered unto him, unto Jeroboam, Vain men, the children of Belial, those are, that's a, a, a word for people who aren't very wise, and have strengthened themselves against Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, when Rehoboam was young and tender, that was Abijah's father, and could not withstand them. And now you think to withstand the kingdom of the Lord in the hand of the sons of David. And yet, yeah, yeah, you're a great multitude. There's a lot of you. And you got the golden calves. You think you're all right. We got 800,000 strong. And we got the golden calves. That Jeroboam made you for gods. And so here we are. 400,000 against 800,000. 800,000 got the golden calves. Going to worship them. And they're going to defeat the kingdom of God in the hands of the sons of David. Now, which one of these do you think are likely to come out on top? Well, let's see. 
Abijah asked him, Have ye not cast out the priests of the Lord and the sons of Aaron and the Levites and have made you priests after the manner of the nations of other lands so that whosoever cometh to consecrate himself with a young bullock and seven rams the same may be a priest of them that are no gods? He says, Y'all, you've turned away. You've rebelled against the truths God revealed to us about how to honor him. He says, But, but us. Now, what I'm here to let you know is that the way to do it is to know what the rules are and follow them. He says, but as for us, the Lord, of, the Lord is our God, and we have not forsaken him. And the priests which minister unto the Lord are the sons of Aaron, and the Levites wait upon their business. Now, you read the scripture, you find out that's what God said, the way it ought to be. Those are the rules. And what do they do? And they burn unto the Lord every morning and every evening, burnt sacrifices and sweet incense. The shoe bread also set they in order upon the pure table and the candlestick of gold with the lamps thereof to burn every evening. For we keep the charge of the Lord our God. But you have forsaken him. You see the contrast? We got choice. We're going to follow the Lord. We're going to acknowledge that God reigns and we're going to follow his rules or we're going to say, no, I'll just make my own God and make up some rules to boot. Now let's see what happens. Instead, Abijah, what, what we ought to do and what Abijah illustrates is that the right thing to do is to embrace a relationship with God. Because that's what God wants, and that's how God will bless. Our faith isn't about learning a lot of rules, learning a lot of ideas and concepts and filling our heads with theology. It's about coming to know who loves us. It's about coming to know his plans for our lives. It's about coming to appreciate his wisdom. Oh, and what a place it is when you... You get to a, you can continue to trust God and you get to a place and you see when you follow his wisdom, you say, oh, good, Lord, thank you that I didn't go the way I thought was right. Scripture says, for there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. The Lord says, there's two ways, there's a broad way that leads to destruction but there's a narrow way that leads to life and he calls us to the way of life because that's the way that his love manifests itself to us he comes in and he makes an abode with us you see when when you accept jesus christ as your savior you're born again and your life is changed and when your life has changed, you now have a relationship to God that you are grafted into him. He is the true vine, and you are the part of the branch. You're, you're made a part of him. Without him, you can do nothing, but with him, nothing is impossible. But the world wants to tell you, no, you don't need, you don't need no God. No, you don't need no God. But if you want one, just make one. But that's not reality as revealed by Scripture. As revealed by Scripture, we are creatures, which means we were made by a creator who knows us infinitely. He knows every thought we think and will ever think and still loves us. So what ought we to do? We ought to embrace a relationship with him. Notice what Abijah says that he and those with him, in verse 12 he says, And behold, God himself is with us for our captain. Is God the captain of your life? Some of you probably heard an old poem, maybe not. Certainly young folks probably hadn't heard it. Growing up in, in, in old folks' day, we used to 
they used to make us learn poetry or read it to us. And there was an old poem uh, written by an atheist called Invictus. And the atheist, William Henley, uh, he has this long diatribe against uh, uh, belief. And he, he comes down at the conclusion. And people often quote the conclusion and not understanding what the whole thing's been about. But he gets to the end and he says, uh, it matters not how straight the gate are charged with punishment the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. All right. Go ahead. We'll see how that works out for you. Sister Green would say, go ahead on. <laughs> now, she means that entirely different when the pastor's preaching. That. But, but uh, we would say back in the day, more power to you. But in truth, we should be brokenhearted to want them to understand that the true captain of our soul, the captain of our salvation, as he's referred to in the New Testament, wants to deliver us from evil wants to deliver us from destruction, wants to deliver us from a destiny of confusion and anguish and frustration and bring us into a place of peace and light and life. But we can only do it if we embrace that relationship with him and want to be in a relationship with him. God himself is with us for our captain and his priests with sounding trumpets to cry alarm against you. We're, tr we're, we're, we're trying to turn you around and we're ready to fight you. Oh, children of Israel, fight ye not against the Lord God of your fathers, for you shall not prosper. Oh, those were wise words. Abijah himself wasn't a particularly great king. Later, scripture tells us that he, he really kind of didn't, he didn't get listed among the good kings. And he only reigned for three years. But in this shining moment, the man told the truth to Jeroboam. Jeroboam, why are you going to... We're, we're, we're following the rules of the Lord. We have accepted God's rule and reign. We are embracing our relationship with him. He is with us. You're going to fight him? It's not going to prosper. Now, a wise man would have given thought, may have given heed and understood, well, let's talk. But instead, what happens? Verse 13. But Jeroboam caused an ambushment to, become, to come behind them so that they were before Judah and the ambushment was behind them. So they were face to face and as Abijah's finishing this challenge. They look around, and there's another army behind them, controlled by Jeroboam. So Jeroboam's basically set a trap. Abijah's telling him the truth, and Jeroboam says, yeah, I got you now. And when Judah looked back, behold, the battle was before and behind. You ever been there? <laughs> That's the rock and the hard place, if you ever wondered about it what that means. You got an army in front of you and one just showed up behind. You can't go forward and you can't back up. But look what happens. And this is why we have to do the fourth thing. Learn this as a fact and principle of life. Trust God's arm of deliverance. Pray to him. Trust God's arm of deliverance. When it looks like there's no way, there's, we're 400,000. They probably got 600 in front and now, 300 behind us. We can't go forward. We can't go back. What do we do? We better surrender. We better give up. We better join them. We better start living the way they do. We better follow his God. But that's not what they did. It reads like this. 
And when Judah looked back and behold, the battle was before and behind, they cried unto the Lord. And the priests sounded the trumpets. Then the men of Judah gave a shout. And as the men of Judah shouted, it came to pass that God smote Jeroboam and all Israel before Abijah and Judah. Y'all, I'm here to tell you that would have been something to see, wouldn't it? I mean, here's the man of God. He's saying, look, folks, y'all need to turn around and follow the Lord. And he looks at his men and says, get him. Get him. And God's folks just say, Lord, help us. Lord, help us. They sh blow the trumpets and they shout victory from the Lord and God fought the battle. And God tells us throughout his word that he wants to fight our battles. That's one of his names, the Lord of hosts. God didn't open a hotel chain. Hosts refer to forces, armies. When he says he's the Lord of hosts, he's the Lord of forces, many, innumerable. He is God Almighty. And he says the battle is not yours but mine. When Pharaoh's army came to the brink of the river, the Lord told Moses, the Egyptians you see today, you will see no more forever. Why? Because the Lord went to battle. And I'm here to tell you, if we will acknowledge the Lord as sovereign and that he reigns, if we will follow his commands and his rules, if we will embrace our relationship with him, grow it, cherish it. When the time comes and we're between two armies, we can call on the Lord. And the Lord says, I got you back. The Lord promised Israel as they went through that I will go before you and I will have your rear word which refers to, I'm behind you too. And that is truth that we have to understand. These are tremendous spiritual facts that the believers of the Lord need to make a part of their lives at whatever age and stage of life we are. To the level of degree of our comprehension and understanding, we need to apply these things. You're in high school, you're in college, you're at the job, you're in the military, you're running your own business. It doesn't matter. You need, we ought to know. <laughs> As Abijah says, ought, ought we not to know? I mean, you would think by now, we ought to know. <laughs> but it seems we stand reminded. And I love how Peter put it in one of his epistles. He said, it shouldn't, it's not a grievous thing to us to be reminded or to, for us to remind you. We, we need to be reminded from time to time. Notice what happened. God smote Jeroboam and all Israel before Abijah, and the children of Israel fled before Judah, and God delivered them into their hand. And Abijah and his people slew them with a great slaughter, so there fell down slain of Israel 500,000 chosen men. But the children of Israel were brought under at that time and the children of Judah prevailed. Why? This is the final thought. Because they relied upon the Lord God of their fathers. Jeroboam learned these lessons the hard way. But we don't have to. You and I can learn these truths and apply them in our lives on a daily basis. That Lord, as Moses said, Lord, if you don't go, I'm not. <laughs> Lord, if, if you don't, I, I'm not going that way if, if you're not leading. Because it makes all the difference in the world to have him in a special place of reverence in your life, recognizing his sovereignty it makes a difference to commit your life to do and to follow his instructions. 
He's not making us do busy work. He's not making us do things that don't matter. He's putting us to do things that will change other people's lives and our own. And we should commit to them. And we need to embrace him in love and fellowship. And of course, we need to rely on his mighty arm of deliverance. Call on him. The Lord says, in the day of trouble, call on me and I will deliver thee. That's his promise. All right, let's stand. Again, it's good to see everybody this morning. I don't know where you are today, but I hope you're in a place of reliance on the Lord, a place where you are seeking his wisdom for the guidance of your life, a place where you're trusting the wisdom he's already provided and, and seeking more. I pray that you and I pray for myself that I never get to that point where I think I know enough. I know enough about God. I know enough to do what I want to do. The prophet Jeremiah says, O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. But there's a, a time and a place where we just need to confess, Lord, I, I need you. need you to bring me out from the place where I am, the mess I made. Just like the prodigal who went off and wasted his substance with riotous living, found himself in a place in the pig trough, looked up and finally came to himself and, I need to go home. I need to go home. And we all need to come to that place. Where are you today? The doors of the church are open to come and talk about where you are. You need to come. You don't know if you have eternal life or not. That's a question that never needs to stay in your mind. God wants that question answered for you. You shouldn't be hoping so. Maybe so. I think so. You ought to know so. You, you, just as about, you ought to know. Ought she not to know? Whether you're going to heaven or not, yeah, he wants us to know. And you can know. We can walk you through the steps to having eternal life. And putting you on a path to following the Lord's rules, living according to his standards. trustees for the giving of our own.
We'd like to thank you for this offering, Father. We'd like to ask you to bless the ones that gave, Father. Bless the ones that for some reason, Father, could not. We ask that you use that to this offering, Father, for the building of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. of our service on the first Sunday to observe the Lord's Supper, an ordinance that the Lord gave to the church to give us an opportunity to be reminded about the price of our redemption. What did it cost for our souls to be saved? It cost the life of God's Son. It cost Him to save us. Surely, every so often, we can take a moment and fully contemplate the significance of love so great for us. And that's exactly what Jesus did when in the upper room with his disciples, after the conclusion of their meal, he, as a separate ser service, took bread, broke it, passed it out to them and he took a cup and filled it and he used the cup and he used the bread to illustrate that he himself was giving his life allowing his body to be broken and his blood to be shed to pay for sins we committed what love as Paul says in the book of Romans Every once in a while, you'll find somebody willing to die for a good man. But God commends his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, which meant enemies of God, Christ died for our transgressions. That, that ought to cause us a strong sense of appreciation, a strong sense of, of reverence that we could be loved like that, and a desire to express gratitude and a willingness to do as he asks us to do for the blessing of others. He wants us to take the good news that's come to us and share it with somebody else. He wants us to live by standards that would illustrate the values of his kingdom. Surely that's not too much to ask for one who's giving his life for us. And he implemented this and he told the disciples, he says, as oft as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Don't do it to check off something on a list of rituals. Do it as a moment of reflection. Each of you who's eligible have received the small cup. On top of the cup is a small wafer. You can access the, the implements by pushing first down and breaking the seal, and then pulling up the, the, the top light cover off the wafer. You can take the wafer out, and then flip the other lid and pull back gently <laughs> unless you want a cleaning bill pull it back gently and expose the other element representing the blood of Christ and you and I have before us implement elements that represent our Savior's sacrifice One more prayer, and then we will come in together. Most gracious Lord, Father, at this moment, your people are gathered, and we humbly bow before you in sincere gratitude for eternal life given, provided by you through Jesus Christ. 
Father, we at this moment want to ask humbly and sincerely for you to fill our minds with thoughts of the joy that we can have because of what you did. Fill our minds with appreciation for what you've done for us and what we possess now because of our Savior's work. Oh Lord, help us to do what pleases you. Help us to trust you with every area of our life to be examples for you. Be light in the darkness of our current world. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let us commune together. Amen. Amen. Well, before we depart with benediction, I know there's at least one announcement. Um, we have the picnic this coming Saturday. Uh, any new word on that, Sister Larry or someone else? Uh, any updates or, or uh, announcement about the uh, brother? Brother. Okay. Picnic t-shirts are ready. Be sure to get yours. All right. Any other announcements? All right. Let's stand. Pray for Pastor Green and his wife. They're on the road on the way back. And pray for him particularly. He uh, uh, injured his knee and is um, perhaps going to need some uh treatment on that and uh, so uh, let's pray for them in their travels most gracious Lord thank you Father for a time in your house today time together to learn from your word and to celebrate our faith in you to celebrate our life in you so Lord we just pray that you would bless and keep us we pray Lord that you make your face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. Oh Lord, lift up your countenance upon us and give us peace. And let us all say, Amen.